Imagine waking up for the first time as a newly, newly created being. You are fully grown, fully mature. You already have great wisdom and knowledge. You see your reflection and know that you were made very special, flawless. You have great beauty. You are perfect. You are greatly favored by your creator and given an important responsibility. You are to oversee the greatest project ever. You, with the other created beings like you, watch as your creators do what seems to be impossible. They create a new realm which never existed before in an instant. You watch as the universe comes into being in the moment of a cosmic explosion. You and the others with you are amazed at the power of your creators. Thousands of other created beings are placed under your authority and you are sent to a new world in this newly created universe to develop it and carry out the plan of your creators. You begin this project and then you realize that these newly created beings that you're doing this project for are lesser beings than you, but the plan says that they will have the potential to be greater than you. Now you don't feel like number one with your creators and set off to rebel against this, this plan of your creator. These new creatures and your creators themselves. This is a tragic story of an archangel who became jealous over the great plan of God. He rebelled against God and tried to overthrow his creators, but he failed. He never had the chance, never had a chance. But his thoughts became so perverted that he thought that he could. He really thought that he could. He was cast down with the angels that were placed under his authority, which chose to side with him against their creators. Today, we're going to read what the Bible says about this former archangel and our adversary. We will also discuss the tactics that our adversary uses against us. If you want a title, our adversary. <clears throat> Have you ever wondered about the beauty of this archangel that's original name has been mistranslated as Lucifer. Why does he remain so appealing to most of the people on the face of the earth? For those that are not clothed in the blood of the Lamb and being diligent to stay focused on Christ's words, Lucifer's appeal is beyond any appeal that could ever be brought before mankind. It is overpowering, yet subtle and sly, until you are engulfed in it. One can easily fall into Lucifer's grasp without even knowing it. Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> 
2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14. No wonder, for even Satan, his new name, after he rebelled, which means adversary, disguised himself as an angel of light. How did God originally create this archangel? What were, what were his attributes? We can read about him in Ezekiel chapter 28. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the immediate prophecies for these verses is towards the king of Tyre. But it does not take you very long to realize that these verses are really not about the king of Tyre, as most of these do not apply, but are in fact God telling us about his most beautiful creation, this so-called Lucifer. Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 12. You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The sardius, topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes were prepared for you on the day that you were created. So what did we learn from these two verses here? Lucifer was created perfect on the day God created him. He was full of wisdom, so that all who heard him were in awe over his intelligence. He was full of perfect beauty, so that all who looked upon him were captivated. He was covered in the richness and splendor of precious stones and gold. His entire being glowed and was mesmerizing. He was placed in the Garden of Eden in his perfection as he was perfect and completed it. Verse 14. You are the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth during fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created till iniquity was found in you. Lucifer was anointed by God as the angel who covered God high above his throne. He had access to the very area which God resided. He was perfectly holy and blameless in all his ways, without error or fault. He turned from God as sin crept into his heart. Lucifer was not created to be evil. But rather, he became evil because of his pride. Just as man has the freedom to choose sin, angels also have the free will to sin. Though most will never consider it. God wanted all his creation to love him of their own freedom of choice. False love has no value. Verse 16. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroy you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fairy stones. 
because Lucifer had been blessed with so much by the Eternal, and always, he became full of conceit and violence in his heart. Because of this sin, God cast him from his position over God's throne as the one who covers and destroy not only his position in heaven, but will destroy him completely in the end. Verse 17. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. Lucifer became arrogant in his beauty. And because his focus on his external qualities, his wisdom could not see that beauty was not enough for him to set himself above the one who created him that way. And with that, God cast him down to the earth before the kings of the earth, that they might be enticed and fall by him. Verse 18. You, you defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Lucifer's sins extended from his arrogance to multiple transgressions so that all of what God had blessed him with became unholy and defiled. All the glory of Lucifer became as a foul odor to God. God turned his glory to ashes and sent him to earth. Though his glory will still appeal to man for a while, as he disguises himself still as an angel of light, in the end, God will destroy Lucifer in the sight of all people who followed him. We see another parallel of our adversary in Isaiah chapter 14. So we can learn a little bit more about our adversary. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. Oh, you are fallen from heaven, O oh, Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. This is the only mention of the name Lucifer in the Bible. But is it truly his name before he became known as our adversary or Satan? Is this truly his name? The English Standard Version has it read reads like this, How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. I gave a sermonette a while ago about the true name of this archangel. It is not Lucifer, which means light bringer, shining one, or morning star. The Hebrew word translated as Lucifer in this verse is Hellel. And it's the only time that this word is Hellel is used in the Bible. It is formed from a primitive root verb, Halah. But Hellel, in actual fact, has nothing to do whatsoever to bring in any light. Strong's uh, Concordance actually says, in the sense of brightness. 
not bringing light, but in the sense of brightness. The Hebrew word, uh, root word, or root verb, I should say, is hala, has two distinctively opposite meanings, both which are amply illustrated in the way this word is used in the Old Testament. It has positive meaning of to shine, and is thus frequently translated as praise and as glory. But hala also has a negative meaning of to boast, to be mad, to be foolish, to rage. It's not the word hella itself that tells us whether it is a positive or a negative meaning which should be applied. It is always dependent upon the context in which this word is being used that makes it clear whether it is a positive meaning or a negative meaning that should be applied. Isaiah 14 verse 12 speaks of Hallel falling from heaven. Hardly a very complimentary statement about Satan. Sounds pretty negative to me. Rather than praising Satan in this verse, God was heaping scorn and contempt on Satan for his unbelievable arrogance. The God of this world. As mentioned in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He has deceived humanity in applying the positive meaning of Hellel to, or Hella to the destination of Hella. In that way, usurped one of the names that the New Testament actually specifies for Jesus Christ. He's taken a name that should apply to Jesus Christ, not himself. With this name, Lucifer, Satan has effectively disguised himself as an angel of light. He wants everybody to call him Lucifer. Because it makes him sound better than he really is. Hillel's original home, as we see it here in Isaiah 14, verse 12. I'm going to read it this way now. How you were fallen from heaven, O Hillel, son of the morning. How you were cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. Heaven was his original home. But God cast him down to the earth. Hillel, or Satan, as he is now known as our adversary, has claimed the sun for his item of worship. So most pagan religions will have symbols for the, of the sun for its worship, including within the Catholic Church, we will see the sun disk above the heads of Jesus, Mary, and the saints. And this is also to draw worship towards the sun, which is claimed by Hillel, or Satan. Sun worship. Hillel's effect on the earth has not strengthened them, but rather weakened them from God's truth talking about how he's hurting the nations, weakening the nations. His plagues have gone out to all the nations of the earth. Verse 14 of Isaiah 14. Verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mountain of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds and I will be like the most high. Because of Lucifer's beauty and wisdom, pride crept into his heart. He thought that he deserved worship 
above every other being and above even God himself. He felt that because of all these blessings that he had that he could become as God was and become the ruler of them all. He was wrong. Satan was cast down to the earth and sits on the throne of this earth trying to destroy the plan of God. He's fully aware of the plan of God. God instructed him on what he was supposed to do. He knows the plan. His mission is to destroy the plan any way that he can. This world is his battleground. We are his main target. Our battle against the demonic forces, against evil spirits who are extremely powerful, we might not be able to see them, but we should know and understand that they do exist and that they are there to do battle against us. Most of the world would dismiss Satan as that he doesn't exist. Or these demons, they don't exist. It's just stories, legends. Our adversary is Satan, the devil, and his demons. Satan is the principality behind the powers of this corrupt world system. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Satan would love nothing more to, than to see us denied salvation. That being the case, it would behoove us to know our adversary, to understand how he operates. We should come to know our adversary regarding who he is and how he maneuvers to destroy us. If we understand these things and put on the armor of God, then we will be prepared to meet Satan's attacks when they come. He is our adversary, and he is out to destroy us. 1 Peter, 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Brother, now we will look at seven tactics used by Satan, the devil, to destroy us. They all start with the letter D. The first one. The most effective tool at Satan's command is that of deception. Deception is the first tactic. Have you ever found yourself in this situation? You're sitting at, in a chair, maybe watching some TV, and you discover that you, you drifted off. You, you fell asleep while watching the TV. And you missed several minutes of the show that you were watching. But it's only after you awaken that you realize that you've been asleep. Right? Until you woke up, you did not know that you were asleep. That is how it is with deception. You don't know, you do not know that you have been deceived until you have awakened from your deception. 
That's how tricky this deception is. You won't even know it until you awake from it and discover it. A deceived person will not even check to see if they have been deceived or are deceived because they don't realize that they've been deceived. Deception is a very powerful tool that Satan uses against mankind. Do you grasp that? Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9 says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Deceives the whole world. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. The whole world is under Satan's sway. Satan was responsible for bringing deception into the world. He brought it into the world. John chapter 8 and verse 44. This is what Jesus had to say. John chapter 8 verse 44. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. Satan deceived Eve into eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that can't happen to us, right? We have God's Spirit. And we can see right through Satan's lies and deception. Right? Matthew chapter 24, verse 3 through 5. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Jesus said that many will come in my name, in Jesus' name. They would presume to represent him, not assume his identity. They would come to proclaim Jesus Christ as the biblical Messiah and would claim to be representatives on the earth. The reality is that they would be part of a vast religious deception. We can be deceived if we are not alert. We know the systems that are out there. Everyone claims they're speaking for Jesus Christ.
2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Mentioned this before, but we're going to read the whole section here now. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whom the end will be according to their works. And this deception would continue to grow worse. Second Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Of course, Jesus himself talks much about this occurring in the Gospels. One can give a whole sermon on just this one tactic of deception. I encourage you to look more of what Jesus had to say. The second tool of Satan that we're going to look at is that of doubt. <clears throat> doubt. Doubt makes you question God's word and his goodness. It is the unwillingness to believe or to be uncertain. It also can be distrust. If Satan can plant doubt in our minds, it will drive us away from God. It is God's desire that we trust and believe in his promises. The one trait that God finds essential in his children is that of faith, which is the opposite of doubt. Hebrews chapter 11, the faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. It is vitally important for us to believe what God says. Otherwise, we cannot please him. The first thing Satan will try to get us to doubt is God's word. That's the first thing. Doubt has become more prevalent in our society today, mainly because of the efforts made by unbelievers and those who strongly oppose God and his way of life. Society has gone the route of questioning the existence of God, questioning God's authority, and questioning God's character along with God's word. Let's go back to Genesis 3 to look at Satan's first use of doubt with mankind. As mentioned in the tool of deception, Eve claimed that Satan deceived her into eating the fruit. But how did he go about performing this deception? Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the eternal God made, had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? You notice how he says that? Satan planted 
the seeds of doubt in the mind of Eve. She took the bait and doubted God's words. This is what Satan continues to do in the world today. He plants seeds of doubt in the veracity of what God has said in his word. The Bible really doesn't mean what it says. That's one of his little lies out there to make us doubt. Satan tried the same trick with Jesus in the wilderness. Trying to make Jesus doubt that he was the Son of God. Ask him to prove it. Make these stones into bread. Jump off here. The angels will get you if, if, if you are the Son of God. But this time, Satan failed. Is Satan causing you to doubt? How do, we, how do we defeat this tactic? I mentioned it before. Faith. Faith is the cure for doubt. Know God. Trust in God. Not in yourself. Knowledge eliminates doubt. Get to know God and his character by studying mm -hmm. your Bible. Trusting in God is a faith builder. Seeing God keep his promises will build faith. The next tactic is that of discouragement. Discouragement. Discouragement makes you look at your problems rather than looking at God. Satan loves to cause discouragement. This tactic is closely tied to the previous tactic of doubt. When we doubt, that is when Satan can hit us with a double punch of discouragement. And discouragement leads to despair. And despair is the catalyst to hopelessness. It brings us to the point of believing that there is no way out. Elijah did great things for God, which resulted in the conversion of thousands of Israelites back to God. But he became discouraged when Jezebel threatened his life. We become discouraged when we make the mistake of focusing more on the attention more attention on the obstacles than we do the opportunities that are given to us. God has given us great opportunities. But we're stumbling over the obstacles. We allow Satan to convince us that we cannot overcome the obstacles that are in front of us. And then we give up. Satan's strategy is to dis disable us and try to take us out of God's plan for us by making us give up. Have you ever felt discouraged? Even David felt this way at times. Psalm 6.6. Six. I'm just going to read a few of these. You can just jot it down and look at it later. Psalm 6.6. Six. I am weary with my growing. All night I make my bed swim. I drench my couch with my tears. Psalm 69 verse 3. I am weary 
with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. David would not allow himself to stay in this state of mind, though. David would turn to God in those times of need and pour out his heart to him, just as you and I can do. Psalm 119, verse 19. I am a stranger in earth. Do not hide your commandments from me. Psalm 119, verse 25. My soul clings to the dust. Revive me according to your word. Psalm 119, verse 28. My soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word. And God heard David and delivered him. We should not allow ourselves to grow weary and give up. That is what Satan wants to happen. We need to remember that God's thoughts and ways are not our thoughts and ways. He answers prayers according to his time frame and not always the way that we would expect we overcome discouragement in the same manner that we overcome doubt. We trust in God. That he has our best interests in mind. We rely on his promises. Discouragement is a sin. Because it is not of faith. Romans 14, 23. If we become discouraged, we need to turn to God in prayer, confess that we have sinned against Him, then encourage yourself in God and in His Word. Rather than dwelling on your own circumstances, read the Word of God for encouragement. Another of Satan's tactics is that of diversion. Diversion. Also, distraction, which is the same. He, Satan mean, makes, makes the wrong things seem so attractive that you want them more than the right things. Satan would love to divert us from the path that we are on and lure us down a different path. He wants to divert us from our original calling and our original election. Peter warns us of this in 2 Peter verse, or chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Satan will do everything he can to divert our energy and our time from making our calling and election sure. Hebrews chapter 12, and verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Read that again. For who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Imagine that. Despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. We need to find those things that are weighing us down to the point of distraction and which diverts us from our course. We need to fix our eyes firmly on the goal line looking to Christ as the author and the finisher of our race. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7. 
you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion does not come from him who calls you. Diversions are not coming from God, but rather from Satan, our adversary. Remember when Jesus was at Mary and Martha's home? Martha was distracted with very much serving. Jesus told her that she was worried and troubled about many things. In other words, diversions were keeping her from taking the time to listen to what Jesus was teaching that day. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Do we allow ourselves to be distracted by things in our past? Taking our eyes on, off the, the goal that is ahead of us? We must keep our eyes on the prize. Keep our eyes on God. Another one of the tactics used by Satan which is also another emotion that we may have felt is defeat. Defeat. By making us feel defeated, Satan can limit us and rob us of our future inheritance. When we feel defeated, it makes us feel like a failure. So that we don't even try. I questioned at first if there was a difference between defeat and discouragement. They are similar and both lead us to the same feelings of despair and doubt. But as a study I thought about it, discouragement occurs when we look at obstacles in our path and become discouraged because we do not believe that we can overcome those obstacles. We had the example of the Israelites as they were on the cusp of entering the promised land and they became discouraged because of a bad report from the men who had spied out the land. So they roamed the desert for 40 years. Feeling defeated is when we encounter circumstances in our lives that just want to make us give up. Defeat has a cousin called disappointment. I would imagine that we have all felt disappointed at some time in our lives. Disappointments can cause feelings of defeat. Maybe you've been struggling with a sin for several years and just can't seem to overcome it. This, this can cause you to feel disappointed in yourself to the point that you just feel defeated and give up even trying. If Satan plays his cards right, he will overcome our future successes when he uses defeat to frustrate us and to stop our moves towards the goal that we have set. All Satan wants is that we give up when we are met with defeat. Through defeat, Satan can again bring question and doubt towards God. 
This can be especially effective tool of Satan as we're approaching the feast. He loves to heap on the trials right before any of the holy days. I ain't going to ask for hands, but I, I know from just talking to a few of us, and even myself, things are starting to happen as we get closer to the going to the feast. He's working overtime on us. He ain't stopping me. I'm going to the feast. Even if they have to send me in pieces. Time doesn't allow for me to cover the book of Job but when you think about it, Satan was hoping for Job to feel defeated and curse God for the circumstances that fell upon him. Having a wife and friends show up to reinforce that feeling of failure certainly didn't help the matter. But take heart. If we fail at something, we don't have to accept the lie of defeat in our life. Let's read what God said to the Israelites in Deuteronomy chapter 4 in verse 30. When you are in distress and all these things come upon you in the later days, when you turn to the eternal your God and obey his voice, for the eternal your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you nor destroy you nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. We cannot allow failures and disappointments to stop our progress and journey to God's kingdom. Thomas Edison once said, I have not failed 1,000 times. I found 1,000 ways that will not work. Satan wants us to feel defeated. He wants us to feel self-rejection, that we are worthless and unlovable. He would love for us to feel that God has abandoned us. Remember Colossians 3, verse 12? Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. We may struggle in our walk with God and stumble along the way, but remember God's promise. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God started this work and he is going to finish it. God never gives up on us. Let's not give up on God. We can also take the heart our, to ourselves uh, the words that David spoke to Solomon in 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 20. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 verse 20. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Do not fear, nor be dismayed, for the eternal God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you, nor forsake you, until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the eternal. This should be our response to our adversary, Satan, when we face a setback in our life. Micah 7, Micah 7 uh, verse 8, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy, when I fall. 
I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the eternal will be a light to me. Delay is another tactic used by our adversary. Delay. Otherwise known as procrastination, but that word didn't begin with a D, so we're going to go with delay. We have all probably been guilty of this at some point in our life. This is, this is one uh, thing that I struggle with. I'll get the bathroom done one of these days. Still working on it. <clears throat> we simply put something off that needs to be done by saying, we'll get to it later. In a lot of cases, it never gets done or it's completed in haste. This can be a very powerful tool in Satan's toolbox. One way Satan can use this is to cause us to, to delay our acceptance of Jesus Christ as our Savior and to be baptized in the body of the church. I know this as I waited over a year to come into the church. I knew everything and thought I was just going to do everything myself. I could have came into church then. I waited over a year. We may have told ourselves things like, well, I need to clean up my act first. I know I did. Or I'm not, I'm not ready to make such a drastic change in my life. Or what will my friends think of me? Oh, my. Remember when Jesus said, follow me to some potential disciples, in Luke chapter 9, verses 59 through 62, they all had excuses. And Jesus said in verse 62, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Satan knows that time is in his favor. And that a lot of those contemplating a decision like this may die before making that decision or just fall by the wayside. Fall by the wayside. Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sour in verses 3 and 4 it says, Listen, behold, a sour went to sow. And it happened as he sowed or sowed that some of the seeds fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. And later, the explanation in verses 14 and 15, the sower sows the word, that being the word of God. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. They procrastinated. They didn't act upon it. Other areas in which we can succumb to this tool is regarding prayer, Bible study, fasting, and meditation. Very easy to put those things off, to procrastinate. And fasted. Do we fast once a year on atonement? Or do we find time to fast other times? If we don't make the time for it, we will find ourselves putting it off and allow our other less important things to occupy our time. Satan will whisper in your ear that you have plenty of time to get it done. You know, sitting on the shoulder there. You had plenty of time to get it done. I tell you, you can do it tomorrow. 
So just enjoy the time you have now. What's the old saying? Idle hands are the devil's workshop. That's an old saying for you young ones. Real old saying. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. There's a lot of truth in that statement. Satan will use this tool in conjunction with diversion to occupy our time. Romans 12.12 12. Romans 12.12 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. How can we combat this tool of Satan? Acknowledge that delay smothers all sense of motivation. Pray to God for wisdom and help in using the time he has given us. Keep a record of how you're spending your time. Refuse to major on the minors and prioritize the things, the important things. Resist the temptation to feel guilty if unforeseeable situations arise. The last tactic of our adversary we will look at is a very powerful one. Division. Division. In Matthew chapter 12 verse 25 Jesus revealed a very critical spiritual law here. This is a spiritual law. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 25. But Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house is divided against itself will not stand. Satan is very much aware of the spiritual law and will use it to destroy marriages, families, friendships, and divide the body of Christ. He looks for ways to inspire disagreements and creates division. It's easy. So disunity by pitting people against one another. How easy is that? The Christian author Francis Frangipan wrote in Becoming the Answer to Christ's Prayer, if there ever was a false doctrine that was so widespread, so accepted in the body of Christ, yet so contrary to the heart and teaching of Christ, it is to the tradition of division within the church. Satan wants division. Christ, Jesus Christ, wants unity. John chapter 17 in verse 11. John 17, verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep them through your name, those whom you have given me, that they may be as one as we are one. Skip down to verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but for also those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. A strong United Church is the testimony 
to the world of the love of God. Satan will do everything he can to destroy that testimony. There is strength in unity. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift his, lift his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. And threefold cord is not quickly broken. When we have when we have another or when we have one another in the body of Christ, we can be strengthened by our brethren in the times of need. Whether spiritual or physical. But when we become divided from that body and find ourselves alone, that is when we find that we are easy prey for Satan. Satan has a strong history of pitting people against one another. Saul was troubled by the evil spirits and became an enemy to David. David's family was pitted against one another. We can find many other examples in the scriptures. When Jesus spoke of the end time, he warned of brother turning against brother. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended will betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew 10 and verse 21. Now brother will deliver up brother to death. And a father his child. And children will revolt against parents and cause them to be put to death. The only way to combat this tool of Satan is with the love of God. As we heard in the sermonette, the love of God. Keeping his commandments. The love of God. Is such a powerful tool. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. I talked about this before, that I thought I had a problem with my neighbor before the spring holy days. I, I wanted to fix that before coming before God and offering my gift. Matthew 18, verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. This principle applies to marriages, families, and friendships. Our goal should always be one of peace and unity. In conclusion, I want to read what Sun Tzu said in the book, The Art of War. If you know the enemy, 
and know yourself, you need not fear the result of a hundred battles. If you know yourself, but not the enemy, for every victory gained, you will also suffer a defeat. If you know neither the enemy nor yourself, you will succumb in every battle. Satan's main objective is the defeat of our life and trust in God for our salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. If we don't want to fall victim to our adversary, Satan, the devil, it is vital that we understand how he works and to understand ourselves. Know our adversary and know yourself. And that you will not and you will not need to fear the results of a hundred battles with Satan, the devil, our adversary. One final scripture. James chapter four and verse seven. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you.